So first off, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to be here. And uh, it's certainly a privilege to be here at this conference and deliver the keynote and to do so in honor of the legacy of Bob Morrison. So thank you very much for that and uh, for the opportunity. So if you think about um, how to discuss value across the creating value across the Smithfield pork chain, I thought we would start by taking a look at um, a little bit of an overview of who is Smithfield today. Uh, our company, like many, has gone through a lot of changes. And um, so, Monty, could you help me with this screen, please? This ch the slides are not changing up here on this screen, so it'll help me from not having to look back if we can get that in, I think, presentation mode or something like that. But anyway, while she does that, and one way to think about it is in, we are farmers. We raise hogs on over 2,800 company and contract farms. We're a big feed company. Uh, we make something like 110,000 tons of feed every week. A large transportation company between hauling feed to farm and pigs to farms and pigs to, to market, something like 21 million miles a year. And so <clears throat> that's certainly a large transportation operation. We're a genetics company, uh, our Smithfield Premium Genetics is top three worldwide just in terms of numbers of commercial guilt production. An environmental services company, uh, we hold over 200 site permits and our team of environmental engineers, environmental management people have a, a business really embedded with all of that. And then of course we're vertically integrated through both fresh meats and further processing. So to describe Smithfield today, the vision of the company is to further transform Smithfield Foods into a world-class consumer packaged goods and protein company, one that consumers feel good about buying from and a partner of choice for our customers. And so as we think about how we go about our jobs every day in the hog production division, we want to be reminded that ultimately we're producing high quality food for our customers. In order to deliver on that vision, our mission is that we are passionate about producing good food the right way. Our business depends on humane treatment of animals, stewardship of the environment, producing safe and high quality food, vitality of the local communities where we produce pigs and work and do business, and creating fair and ethical, rewarding work and environment for our people. So you can summarize all that up, but the things that are important to us are how we care for our animals, how we care for the environment, the communities, and the people that work in our organization. And I think that's probably sound principles for all good companies. Looking at the global operations, so this will give you a bit of a, cha a, bit of a, a better description of what is the vertical integrated structure of Smithfield today. And this slide right here just tries to capture the Smithfield Foods company piece of this. This has no data or information that's related to WH Group or Sean Wei, the business over in China. But Smithfield today is a $15 billion turnover global food company. We have operations, raised pigs in five countries, 54,000 employees worldwide. And our um, market hog production is about 22.6 million worldwide. That's about 17 million in the United States. Uh, which about 39 million um, hogs harvested every year. So in the US, we're roughly 50% <clears throat> company owned, produced, and 50% bought on the open market. And we do have an expansion of a new packing plant uh, near Mexico City that's just opening up later this year, so we'll be having an increase in number of hogs processed as we go forward. The business turns that meat into 3.8 billion pounds of packaged meats. We also are in the poultry business, not many people know that, it's not a very big piece of our business that's over in Europe, but we have involvements in chicken, geese, and turkey production, and we're the number one supplier in the United States to the retail chain, to the food service chain, and to the export chain of pork products. And so this gives you a sense of um, where we go. Today we export U.S. pork to 40 different countries from the United States. As you all know, it's not been the best year with regard to trade situations for export, but still a big part of what we do. 
So just kind of depict the vertical integration that we have. And I would probably, if I was redoing this slide, add the genetics business at the top of this vertical integration chain. But we do have our own hog production, as I mentioned, about 50% of the hogs that we harvest. That turns into our fresh pork products, packaged meats, and, and then ultimately into consumer products and things of that nature. And so the opportunity with the vertically integrated system is to really be able to capture feedback across that chain from what customers want or what the challenges to meeting the customer's desires might be and feed that back through our business, whether it's how we approach our genetic improvement and genetic priorities or how we raise the animals <clears throat> or how we might feed them differently to ultimately affect uh, and produce better quality meat. So then again, just the standpoint of market chain in the U.S., uh, our live production accounts for about 15% of the U.S. market hog production. We harvest about 26% of the hogs that are produced in this country. And from the standpoint of packaged meat market share, we have the largest market share of pork packaged meat products at about 19% of the business today. And you can see a number of other familiar players there and um, how that works out. So it's a big business and um, we get the question a lot of times and a lot of times the question comes from our employees. It's, it's, it's interesting, uh, they'll ask the CEO, Ken Sullivan, quite frequently, so who do we sell to? Or if we're raising this product and we want to buy Smithfield products, who do we buy from? And the answer to that is really pretty much everybody that's in the retail food service or restaurant business. Um, we have a large market share and so we have national distribution and, and these are just uh, some of the, the logos of companies that you'd be familiar with that are customers of the pork products that we produce. So next I want to talk a little bit about our guiding principles and as we move in I want to think a little bit about research and how uh, innovation and research affect the organization. It's first important to understand the culture of the business and how does the, how does the organization uh, view or value research innovation, risk taking is a part of that. Uh, when Mr. Ken Sullivan became CEO about five or six years ago, Ken put forward these three guiding principles that uh, we go by to sort of lead where we want to take our business today. <clears throat> It's um, three areas, ROI, uh, he has this little pig mascot that he names Roy that he shows around on these little cartoons and things like that, but uh, Roy stands for ROI. The R, responsibility, uh, we will accept responsibility in everything that we do. The O stands for operational excellence. Our pursuit of operational excellence will be unrelenting and so that's our notion of continuous improvement and always trying to do better today than, than what we were able to accomplish yesterday. And then third and really what I want to focus on with regard to this conversation today is innovation, a culture of innovation. And it's stated here in our guiding principles that innovation will be part of our DNA. And so I think that's important when we think about trying to use objective facts from a research group to influence the organization, you have to have a notion of acceptance, a culture of innovation, and, and also some allowance of risk taking in order for that to be effective. So in that context of that culture and those guiding principles of the business, we've established uh, the following mission and purpose for the Hog Production Division Technology Development and Implementation Group. And that is that our job when we come to work every day is to conduct an internal technology development effort across the organization. We want it to be innovative. We want it to be future focused. We want it to be strategic in nature. And our group will work to identify both near and long term opportunities, evaluate the ideas, evaluate the application to the organization, and then track implementation to achieve economic benefit. So I think that whole piece of it and that last part of it is critically important. Uh, doing the work and putting it in a drawer, leaving it on a shelf doesn't do a whole lot to improve the business. And frankly, often the hardest part in a big system like this is who and how do you effectively communicate communicate the results of what you learn, so that turns into real change and brings benefit that can be tracked uh, in the business. And I, frankly, our ability to do that is, is key to us being able to continue to, allow to, do, to be allowed to do it and, and to try to be successful in that effort. 
So in order to do that, in order to implement this mission and purpose of our uh, hog production division technology and um, innovation team, we rely heavily on a cross-functional research committee. And I'll show you on the next slide who's on that committee. But what we've tried to do is assemble people from across the primary business units of the hog production division, then include representation from the fresh meats business, and then kind of down on the matrix side of that, include the technical specialists and specialties that are represented in the company. So, in, you know, people like nutritionists, people like manu feed manufacturing specialists, people like geneticists, people like veterinarians and so try to piece together the technical specialties with the business pieces of the business responsibility to get a good representation of the business and help us determine what are the priorities and what projects we should be working on. So what we asked this research committee to do, and there's a full-time staff of people in the science and technology group, myself and Dr. Ashley Dedecker and Dr. Christina Phillips, and the, the role of that group is to really prioritize and really organize the function of this research committee. Set the agenda, keep the minutes, record the opportunities, we'll manage and conduct the experiments and things like that. But we rely on the committee as a whole to standardize the priorities for the business. And so the first thing we want to know is what's our focus from the standpoint of needs to the research group. We work through a process that I'll explain a little bit later on to objectively rank project ideas and, and we'll take that to the committee and ask for their input and ultimately the committee's input to select the highest value products. We rely heavily on this committee when it comes down to the final steps of experimental design. And I think this is critically important is to get a lot of impact, a lot of input when we're doing our experimental design so that we can tailor the projects and the research um, experiments that we do so that they'll fit the needs of the community, fit the needs of the ultimate customer or audience. If you leave just the scientists in a room sometimes to think of their own solutions, sometimes we're not asking the question that's really needed to be answered down on the farm, if you will. So this assisting in trial design from the input from the committee is really important. And then after that, we ask that group to look at the data with us, look at the outcomes, and think about how we describe the implications for the completed trials. In other words, this is the no these are the numbers and these are the outcomes, but how do we translate that into pieces of information that we can effectively communicate to the business and create and drive change. And then ultimately identify and monitor implementation. So this is the current makeup of the production, hog production division research committee. And you see across the top <coughs> the different departments that are represented. And the science and technology function there on the left what I say about us in that group is we're the people that, that come to work every day and get paid to think about research and science and technology. And what we need to rely on are people from these other committees or other areas of business, support operations. There we have people from feed manufacturing specialties and nutrition. Uh, from the production divisions, this is really where the rubber meets the road in the business, the farm operations people. We have specialists in sow production, maybe grow finish production marketing animals. Our veterinary, we have veterinarians from those divisions in our business. Largely our veterinarians are organizationally embedded in our production operations division. So we have veterinarians from there that are part of this group. And you see that we try to get representation from east coast to west coast, sort of the broader geography of the business, so that we're thinking about the challenges uh, that, that are represented across different parts of the country. Dr. Dustin Moorhauser is a meat scientist from the Fresh Meats Division, Kent Gray uh, from our SPG business, and we also have people there from some of our grain procurement and, and purchasing activities. In addition, I've got a little asterisk up there. We have a, an additional subcommittee of this group um, that, that really just gives advice and leadership on what we call veterinary research, projects that are almost singularly focused, let's say, on vaccine or health topics or, or therapeutic trials or something of that nature will take to the, to the, the veterinarian uh, subcommittee, the veterinary research subcommittee, and ask them for those same answers. What are your priorities, uh, what the aspects of trial design would make these outcomes more useful to you and so forth. 
So this is just a flow chart of how our process works and the abbreviation on here S and T in each of these bullets is the science and technology department. But really we move from concept where ideas are either received or developed within our group and, uh, and, and I'll show you in a few minutes but we have a, a discipline where we use a matrix calculator to estimate the economic value and come up with a numerical, numerical ranking for each project idea. And so we like to have an objective approach to help us think about which projects are most, most valuable and how they align with our strategic priorities. And the ones that rise to the top, then the science and technology group will develop a draft protocol. And then when we have our bi-monthly science and technology committee meetings, the research committee meetings, we'll bring those protocols to the committee and then ask for refinement and challenge and, and things that would make the outcomes more useful useful. And then when it comes down to execution of the project, um, there is a staff, uh, and I'll give you an overview kind of our research capacities a little bit further along, but we have um, um, dedicated staff that work in dedicated research sites that coordinate execution of all the trials. And so again, people that come to work every day and what their job is to do is to allocate uh, pigs to trials, collect the information, bring that back in, and then there's also data management, statistical support staff, and this is all part of the science and technology function. And then when the results come back in, the first group in the company to see the results and to talk about results is that research committee. The people that had their hand in prioritization of that topic, in design of that trial, those are the first people that we want to have back in results so that we don't get a lot of conversation going on out there until we're really sure where we stand. Do we need to do more work? Have we reached a conclusion? Are we ready for prime time, if you will? Or have we got more to go back on? And then ultimately, communication out to the system and implementation. And so again, that last step there is, is really as important or more so than any of the others if we're going to have an impact to the integrated value chain. Now, I thought I'd just give you a few thoughts about things that we think are important when it comes to the nuts and bolts of conducting effective internal research like this. And, and so here we've just tried to capture a few thoughts about principles of project development when um, trials are being done. And the first thing that I put up here is that there needs to be a clearly defined focus on the research objective. Sometimes I see a tendency in our group to try to answer too many questions with one trial. And as I say kind of down there at the bottom, it very rarely are there any important questions answered with one trial. Oftentimes in order to do the project well, we have to do a series of experiments to ultimately come to that answer. But if we get focused then on a clear research objective, we can move on to the next steps of um, designing the study. The second thing I've listed here, and one that I think is critically important and sometimes overlooked, is doing a proper job of sample size calculation, the statistical power test, to understand how many replications, what's the, what's the variation of the, of the response criteria we're looking at, and so if we're looking for a difference in treatments or some aspect of that, how many observations is it going to take for us to, to measure a statistical difference, to get a sound statistical answer. And, and if we can't design the study with the proper number of variables, the proper sample size, the proper statistical power, then we stop there. We basically say we don't have the resources to do that trial here. Or we go back and rethink the number of treatments that we're able to apply so that we can increase the statistical power and maybe we have to do more than one trial to ultimately get to the answer. But I think this step of sample size calculation and designing and conducting research where you have proper statistical approach is important. And then from there, basics of appropriate experimental design, what are the variables of interest, what are the proper control or controls, maybe a positive and negative control, um, accurate data collection to minimize experimental error and enhance sensitivity. We hold our research technicians, our farm staff, two standards of accuracy. They're, they're graded essentially based on their ability to minimize standard error in data sets. And so we try to work very carefully with, uh, with them so that we know that we're getting good information upon which to make decisions. And, and, and that's part of controlling variation. And then again, as I said earlier, 
um, I think it's important to recognize that, that most of the really hard questions that we're tackling, uh, we don't get a simple answer from one trial. And so more than one step may be required to come to the answer. And of course, repeatability is essential before we make too many um, big judgments. Also, just thinking a little bit about the appropriate experimental standard operating procedure, SOPs. Uh, we've tried to go through at all of our research sites and constantly train and document and retrain our staff on how we'd like to have every treatment run from a consistency point of view. So we've got SOPs out there for proper allotment of pigs to treatment. And of course, this is to decrease variability and uh, help us better detect treatment differences they exist. We've installed equipment like electronic data capture, individual electronic uh, animal identification, and so we get weights, then it automatically loads that into a computer for us, and so that reduces experimental error, um, just transporta uh, transposition of data and that sort of thing. Uh, we require, every time we do a data calculation, we require an analysis update, just calculate means and make sure we have all our observations cleaned up within 24 hours after that data is done. And so what you don't want to do is wait till the, the trial is already done and find out that maybe there was an observation missed or there's an illogical entry somewhere back on the third observation of a 10 observation trial. The pigs are gone to market and there's no way to go back out there and straighten that out. So it's trying to control that sort of focused discipline on execution of every trial. If feed is involved, we want to always, of course, um, sample those um, those feed treatments and understand that we've got the right nutrient or the right additive or the right drug or whatever might be involved. And then what we will always do with our trials is um, we'll do health monitoring along the way. Essentially we'll just hang ropes and just do general diagnostics so that we can understand what was the environment or the disease challenge that a particular group of pigs went through because that's always important with some context in a lot of what we're trying to analyze is you know what what was the circumstances that the pigs were under during that study and so here I've listed what are our 2019 our current research objectives and we look at the world in short term, we define our, our short term, maybe I should more often or more appropriately call it near term opportunities of zero to 18 months. And we define longer term opportunities as something like the three to five year window. And sometimes we debate if five years is too long because I know all of you recognize the pace of change in this industry today. Uh, and it's hard to predict what things and what our needs and priorities will be in five years. But under the zero to 18, month you see things like feed and feeding, improving production management and the top two entries under there are, are, are linked to the sow herd and sow performance and of course animal health. So as people familiar with the industry, those are really our big dollar impactors from the standpoint of feed as a primary input, sow productivity as a basis for really sound uh, economic commercial production and health tied closely to that. You know, currently our, our two top animal health priorities that we're focused on are managing influenza and PERS. If you'd seen this a couple of years ago, PED would have been on there. Uh, that's moved, uh, at least for now, off the list from the standpoint of research and development, not that there aren't challenges in the commercial system. Uh, but but so, so this does have um, change as time goes, as we go over time. Under the three to five year window, the top one you see up there is a big bucket called brand enhancement. And what we mean by brand enhancement is, can we come up with innovations or solutions at the at the farm level, at the hog production division level, that will address some of the issues that are out there in front of consumers today. So thinking about the first one there, responsible use of antibiotics, the issue of antibiotic resistance obviously is a big topic. It's, I see in the program that it's a, a major topic of conversation at this conference here this week. So helping us think about that internally is important to us. Uh, we have an effort that's in collaboration with the pork board 
forward on trying to, to understand pain mitigation. How do we quantify pain more appropriately so that if we find products and tools to minimize pain mitigation, how do we objectively say that we've been successful? And I think everybody's familiar with that uh, issue when it comes to consumers and uh, certain activists, of course. And then we've got needless injections up there is a technology and innovation we continue to look at and work on because we still have challenges at times with um, with needles ending the, uh, ending up in products and in the food supply chain. This topic of lifetime sow productivity really is a longer term project in that we continue to do a lot of work on trying to understand what we do and how we manage uh, our future sows from the standpoint of about the time they're weaned even to the litters they're nursed in and the way we feed them and raise them and so those are longer term opportunities just because uh, they involve everything from sort of guilt development up through three parities and so those are almost multi-year studies when we look at things like that. And then we've got this notion down here at the bottom of this bucket called new technology development. And that really is our big kind of innovation place. That a lot of these topics are somewhat applied and practical, but we, we want to have time for really pushing along for new tools and development of new technologies that we can apply to the business. Um, we have an initiative on working on improved uh, animal health. Uh, I'll talk a few minutes. We've just opened a new research vaccine laboratory, so our primary innovative effort there is in the world of vaccines. Um, improving production efficiencies is a big bucket, but we've got projects there where we're looking at remote monitoring of weight in pigs in barns, and so we can do a better job of knowing how they're growing, knowing who needs to be sold when. Uh, we're looking at projects like remote monitoring of feed supply on farms so that we could automate feed ordering and do a better job with some of those type things. Um, and all of that, of course, is to help us do a better job improving pig performance. So in this whole context about doing research and doing internal research, one of the things that uh, Monty and I talked about was to share a little bit about you know, what's the culture for risk or what's the appetite for risk in the organization and how do you get evaluated if you have a dedicated research group uh, so you've got a budget and we're spending money, right? And so somewhere you've got to say, hey, there's got to be a culture that will let you try and fail, but there's also an expectation about everything in business that you have more successes than you have failures. So how do you, how do, you do that? And so the first thing I would say about this to share with you to think about is all information, all data comes at a cost. We can't capture growth rate, we can't capture diagnostics, we can't capture anything without investing money to, to capture data. And so we have to realize that at the start, but we also try to push forward the notion that it's easy to understand, um, you know, Gonzalo, I think about Randy Stacker, he used to have a saying that he said to me a lot of times, we sometimes know the cost of everything and the value of nothing, right? And so sometimes in business it's easier for us to know the cost than really translate cost into a value proposition. And so linking good data from performance and outcomes is important to know something about value. So it, it takes some, some spending to get to that number. Um, the organizational expectations are clearly that the benefits will exceed the cost, but then the question comes, what's the allowance or appetite for risk? Because you have to say right up front that all experiments will not result in a product or process, a new process implementation. All the experiments we do are not going to improve the business. And every innovation effort that we're invested in right now will not result in a new technology being successfully deployed. So in order to manage that, we have to go into it and say, you know, there's risk there and there will be some things that don't turn out successfully, but nothing ventured, nothing gained. So a sound research program needs to employ an organized approach to manage that risk and focus on high value outcomes. And so I want to talk a little bit about how we try to do that when we look at the projects we invest in and the way we spend our money in research. 
So I mentioned earlier, there's really two big aspects, two big tools that we use. The first tool we use is the, is the topic of the project prioritization thing, the thing I showed you, the zero to 18 months and the three to five years. That brings focus, okay? So the first thing you have to do is say, what's important to the business? And if we can stay focused on that list of things that are important in the business, it keeps us disciplined and it avoids maybe the academic in us from wandering off into academic curiosity instead of business priorities. Priority. So the first thing you have to do is a real clear focus and you have to have the discipline to stick to it. And then we created this little project um, prioritization matrix. And it's not the most scientific thing in the world, but it's a tool that we use to walk through and create an objective score for each project idea and decide what to do or what not to do. It wouldn't surprise you to think that we have a lot more projects come to us, a lot more product trials, a lot more ideas than we could ever um, conduct the trials on. So we have to decide what's most important to us. And so we do that by using this tool. There's one other thing that layered in beside this, and, it, and every year that we'll sit down with our accounting and finance group, and we will ask them to put an economic value to every unit of change of all of our production KPIs, each key process indicator. So once a year, we'll update what is the value of one point change in fee conversion in the nursery one point change of fee conversion in finishing, one tenth of a pound of average daily gain, one extra pound of throughput uh, in terms of growth rate impact, what's the implication of a one percent improvement in nursery livability and so on and so forth. So as we go through and look at ideas and we have projects that we think we can address a challenge in production like let's say pre-weaned mortality, we can weigh off cost and projected benefit in order to think about which projects offer us the best promise to the business's bottom line. So we sort of walk through this little um, program here, this little matrix here. The first question we ask is, does the objective fit the Smithfield's priorities? Yes or no? If no, stop now. Okay. If yes, then we go through and do a little bit of an economic analysis on it. The first question is, if it's implemented, would capital be necessary? If so, we've got to go through and use those KPI estimates of value and trade that off against capital cost and return, and then calculate an expected return over uh, capital employed. Most of the time, we don't have to go through all of that. If it's not a capital project, we do an ROE or return over expense. And so we just calculate a simple ratio. If the cost and the value proposition is one to one, it scores a one. If it, if it, you know, the value over the cost is five to one, it scores a five. And so we generate this value proposition. The next part there, question number three, tries to estimate either the cost savings or the margin improvement impact. And so. So what we're trying to do here is say, what's the total dollar impact to the system if we were successful with this project and it was completely implemented across our business? And so some projects may have a really good, a really great ratio on return on investment, but not a huge cost saving or margin impact. So let's say that I'm looking at a product that goes into my first early wean feed and that's, at, uh, that's fed at one and a half to two pounds per head of pigs. It may have a nice ROE, but if I save you know, a penny or two pennies or five pennies in two pounds of feed, that's not a lot of dollars across the whole system. But I may find something with a two to one ROE that goes in 300 pounds of top hog feed and that's millions of dollars. And so we're trying to understand the value of the product plus the total impact to the business and score them based on those kind of estimates. And then the number four there is the one that is the most subjective, but we think that it's important and that is some estimate of the effort required to implement the, the change were it to be decided on. And so let me give you kind of the extremes there. Something that would be very difficult would be that we have to put a new piece of equipment in every farrowing crate and retrain every farrowing house employee how to use something different. That would take a long time and it would take years. And so even though it's a great idea, if we can't get it implemented, 
near term, it may not be the best value for us to be working on today, okay? And the simplest one would be something that we make a decision and we tell the nutritionist, put that in the feed and you push the button on the formulation and it's in the computer, that's a five. That's as easy as it gets. And so we add those things up and then try to use those final numbers to figure out what are the most important projects to work on? And what I would say about this matrix with regard to its precision is I would not stand here and tell you that, it, that I can tell you that we do a great job of sorting between 12s and 13s and 15s. But what you'll find when you employ a tool like this is that the results are very bimodal. The results are either 5 or 6 or less or 12 or above. It's, it's plain as the nose on your face, if you will. And it does a really good job of you know, sorting through a lot of the debate and a lot of I believe and I think and maybe this and keeping our group focused on where the bigger opportunities are. And one other thing I would say about this is we do have up here kind of in the top right of that a little star by um, the word pilot. And what we look at, sometimes an idea comes along that's not in our priorities. It was not on our list. And we want to try to have some allowance in there that says, but this is something new and something we never thought of. And then we look at something that we might classify as a pilot study. If we think that the concept is practical and promising and that we can take a look at it with minimal resources and time, that's animals, time, labor, that sort of thing. And if it were successful, would it be impactful? Then we may make a decision to do a two, three, seven week pilot study or something like that. So we, we do try to keep the window open for things we never thought of uh, to, to have a place in a creative, uh, innovative process. So um, next, just kind of give you a quick overview. So talk a little bit about our research facility starting on the far right. We have two farms in North Carolina that are dedicated to research. The first one, which is that not the picture on the far right, but the one just to the left of that, uh, that's our 3514 farm. In that farm, we have a full-scale nutrition metabolism laboratory uh, with fecal and urine collection laboratory analysis of feeds. So we do a lot of just basic fundamental work there on ingredient valuations and things that support the nutritionist in our feeding program. We also have some rooms that are set up with environmental controls and what I say by that is that we have the ability to manage the heat and temperature in there so that we can do some heat stress work and try to look at things that might help us deal with mitigation of heat stress in our environment in the summertime. And then we have the other barns there that are set up just large scale grow finish trials uh, grow finish um, feeding and essentially what, when, when it's a research barn instead of a regular barn it means that we can monitor feed consumption on a per pen basis and pig weight on a per pen basis and so that's what we have sitting in there. Farm 26012, the one on the far and right, is an eight barn nursery site and every one of those pens in there is set up for weighing feed and pigs on a per pen basis. So it gives us ability to create a lot of replications of nursery trials, grow finish trials. As you move back over to the left there, the research site in Utah is a 5,000 sow farm which we have focused on sow research there. So we can feed different, uh, different feed treatments there and other uh, treatments can be implemented there in that system. The Iowa research site on the far left is a wean to finish site. So we've still got nursery and finishing in our grow out system. We've got a lot of wean to finish there. Our Midwest division, Iowa, is, is largely a wean to finish business today. And so we do our research on that phase of performance there. And then in the bottom left hand corner, we've got something there called research in commercial farms. We have a staff of employees who spend their days uh, doing work at farms not these research farms. So let's say that we want to apply some method of implementation of vaccine, timing of giving a vaccine, dosing or things like that. We have a group of people that will go into commercial farms and apply those treatments, uh, tag those pigs, weigh them periodically along as they move out of that sow farm down through the system and help gather information like that. So. Um, at all of these farms, there are dedicated research staff that work beside the normal production staff. And, and these farms are all part of our normal production system, so they're not really different uh, from that point of view. 
The other facility we have is what we're calling our Vaccine Research and Development Laboratory. This is a new facility that we just uh, took over, uh, began, got and received control of late last year. Uh, this is on the North Carolina State University Centennial Biomedical Campus, which is right there on the footprint of the vet school. I'm sure many of you guys have been there. And the purpose of this facility is to improve herd health and productivity through working with different groups and organizations on new and novel vaccine technologies. Uh, we've got some partnerships with some animal health startup companies, some non-traditional vaccine manufacturers. We've got some partnerships with some traditional vaccine manufacturers. But the big idea is there, can we learn more and access uh, for our system uh, vaccine technology ahead of the kind of long tail that comes on the commercial availability curve and the time that it takes to move toward full licensure and approval. Uh, our goal here is really not to produce cheap vaccines. This is not a traditional autogenous lab to produce at a lower cost that we can buy from, from, from good suppliers and partners that we have in place. It's really different products and new solutions for disease challenges that we don't have today. This is staffed with um, two PhD virologists. And as I said, we really uh, took that over in November and we've got four products in development out there today and uh, a number of partners they're engaged with us. This is just a quick, uh, just a, a look at the at the full time, at the dedicated research staff. So it gives you an idea. The science and technology group. I've referred to that a couple of times. Uh, Dr. Decker on the right. Uh, she manages our work at the Utah Research Sal Research Farm and supervises our specialists that do in-the-field commercial research uh, on a daily basis. Uh, Dr. Phillips looks over um, management of our research at the Nelson Farm and the Wing to Finish space in Iowa, and then our, our two research farms in North Carolina, the nursery site and the grow finish site. And then um, Jennifer Wood is our data specialist that uh, captures up and proofs all our data and, and, um, and does our stats for us and that kind of thing. So it's not a big group, but as I've said a couple of times before, this group gets paid to come to work every day and think about, conduct, and do research. So it's dedicated uh, to those efforts. Thinking about well, then what are our research capabilities, um, we do have a, and have employed a large research capacity. And the only reason I bring that up is I go back to that comment that I made earlier about the importance of statistical power and doing our power tests right. We believe that um, you know, to do the work in a meaningful way, we've got to approach it with enough numbers, enough replications. And so when I talk about capacity, I'm talking about the capacity to replicate treatments in a controlled study. And so that helps us, I think, move faster if we can apply more replicate, replications and be more confident in the outcomes. And if we're gonna make a decision that's gonna turn an 18 million market hog a year ship, we need to know really pretty strong that the data is sound and that it's reflective of what's in our system. We try to be efficient with the use of our resources. Um, this just lists a number of trials that we've completed in the last few years. And, and in the end, I think, you know, the title of this talk was using research and innovation to influence the, the value chain. I think what we're trying to do is provide that bullet at the bottom, a unique capability to bring objective data to bear regarding management or process implementation questions, product evaluations, technology development. It really is all about that question about data and the value of data and how you can bring it to bear to improve your business. Um, last couple of things I'd like to think about is, is, is questions we get a lot of time is do you collaborate? What's your thought about uh, data sharing and working with people outside your system? And, and we do value external collaboration and we routinely and really are constantly uh, collaborating with people either uh, from an industry collaboration there. I lift up uh, projects that we do with the pork board 
We have a number of academic co collaborations, particularly things like cell longevity. We've done a lot of work both with the industry and with different universities. We do have the advantage to have a lot of cells, and when it comes to thinking about like multi-parity um, cell performance studies, that's difficult at most universities with small cell herds to do. And so we're we're open and receptive to collaborations in those types of things. We also collaborate uh, with private uh, companies and public companies, um, work on things like data for vaccine licensing and new technology startups. Um, we are open to having graduate students work in our system uh, if there are projects there that are of mutual interest and benefit to both parties. What we see is the benefits of collaboration. Um, you know, what we can provide for collaborative partners is labor, access to farms, uh, and, and we happen, we have a lot of pigs, as you know. Um, we do have full-time people with expertise in protocol development and data collection and statistical analysis and so forth. And what we get from collaborators is new information about what's in the pipeline on process and products, their knowledge and expertise and opportunities for first adoption, and maybe even we might negotiate for some favorable pricing. You never know how things like that would go. So just kind of wrapping this up sort of on some final thoughts, and that's about a lot about our system and how we apply it and how it works. I think, you know, as you guys head into the next um, day or two of, of thinking about science in this conference, I would put to you that um, I believe that research and technology has always been the driver of agricultural, you know, performance improvement, and particularly in animal agriculture, and it will continue to be critical for driving enhancements in food and protein production. I think the topics we're going to work on in some things like uh, just the need to enhance efficiency and productivity, which is something we've all been working on for years and years, that's going to continue to be an important objective of research just to, to feed the growing world demand for safe and affordable food and for high quality protein. But I think in addition to just enhancement of efficiencies and productivity, researchers and veterans veterinarians and animal scientists together are going to be more often called on in the future to address the concerns of consumers. Uh, our customers are at some level asking questions and some are concerned about how modern agriculture impacts things like the environment. Uh, how it affects in the role it plays in antibiotic resistance. There are conversations and interest in how our animals are housed and raised, as you know. And so I think the answers to some of those questions will also come from innovative and collaborative uh, research to address those consumer questions and, and things that are there. I've just put a bullet in there. I think in my time in the industry, which has been a long time, I haven't seen nothing but an acceleration of the pace of change. And I think the change that's underway today with regard to both challenges and opportunities in food animal production, swine production, as well as technology and change is faster than I've ever seen. And I think it's continuing to accelerate. And so for those of you that are in the earlier stages of your career, I think there's never been a more exciting time to, to see what's going on in our our industry and I think the next few years um, will will be amazing when we see how much change occurs. I think there's going to be a significant impact of new areas of technology on livestock production. When you think about this whole issue, this, this big topic that people are writing about, the farm of the future, application of technology, digital systems into agriculture. In general, I think the industry believes today that agriculture is sort of behind the curve on application of these technologies and that animal agriculture is behind crop production when it comes to these technologies. And so so I think that the sky's the limit there, and I think is that as we go th into the future, um, things like computing, remote monitoring, the whole technology of big data will become more impactful on our business. And for scientists and veterinarians that are working in the industry, this is going to represent a lot of new opportunities, but it will require a willingness to collaborate. I think as the, as the, as the topics get more complicated, it's going to take more specialties working together, veterinarians,
veterinarians, animal scientists, engineers, computing engineers, data scientists, robotics people, who knows what that might be. But the critical factor then will be to maintain an openness to new ideas and to do so in a culture that allows rewards and risks. So I thank you again, Monty, for the invitation to be here. I thank you all for your attention and time, and I'll be happy to answer questions if you have some. Thank you very much, Terry. I appreciate it. Um, let me put back the phone number that I had up here um, to, for you to be able. It's 651-492. 6964, um, feel free. We got a few questions, but um, yeah, uh, keep sending them. So, so you just talk about your last part of, about the technologies and how things are changing and uh, pace very, uh, very rapidly, right, with the, all the big data. Could you expand a little bit more about which technolo technologies, of all those that you see in the horizon, which ones um, Smithfield is looking at them more closely? So I think the things that we're most interested in, um, in that kind of bucket of, of kind of science fiction technology stuff out there, one is remote monitoring of animal weight. I think if we could know what pigs weigh in barns every day, we could detect things like changes in health status, off-feed situations. Uh, there's also a big value proposition there to sell pigs at the right weight. Uh, everybody knows that you sell pigs into certain weight matrices and the ability to do that with greater precision, to know where those animals are, perhaps to link all of that through big data systems that schedule trucks of when and where to be and how to pick up, uh, perhaps uh, to have systems that when animals are ready to be marketed, they're sprayed and you know which ones they are, so rather than having people that have to climb in pens and mark animals and you have the whole issue of employee and injury and risk and things like that, so that monitoring of animals and how they're performing and growing in barns, I think that is an area that, uh, that is an area that we've spent five or six years investing and working with partners in and one that we think offers a lot of potential, and it's not one that's simple to achieve. Talking about technologies and looking at the future as well, how do you see the world of genomics and gene editing? I think, you know, genomics has already made an incredible impact on a pace of genetic improvement. Um, and what we look at, um, I think, you know, we, we've applied that within our genetics business now for seven or eight years. And in traits that traditionally had low heritability, like our reproductive traits, the heritability on those was generally considered around, you know, 10 or 11 percent. The application of genomics has moved that into maybe 30, 35 percent and so the slope of the line of improvement has changed pretty dramatically. I think from a challenge point of view as we look into our system we can see that we are we are more rapidly increasing the the relatedness of our animals than we anticipated and so the application of genetics is going to require us to be deliberate about uh, infusion of genetic diversity more frequently than we've have had in the past because we're we are concentrating genes and because of our genomic selection from the standpoint of gene editing I think it's a technology with incredible promise uh, the big bogey out there is consumer acceptance and I you know I think the talk right now is that that it, the big bogey may be FDA versus USDA, and that's important from a regulatory point of view. But as a food company, uh, the big bogey is consumer acceptance. And who wants to be first? And what's the risk if it's in your system and not in your system that the, that the one that doesn't have is going to sell against the one that does? And so I think that's the big question out there. One question that uh, came up as well, uh, it's in regard to communication. And you talk about the, your communication internally uh, on your research and so on, but how um, do you communicate some of the trials to the field and then how is it communicated if you do? Communicate to where? The outcomes of your research to outside your organization. If, occasionally we do, like so uh, if we have, um, if we have a, a, a business collaborator, uh, we'll often sign what we call a business agreement on data sharing. And in general, what our business agreement requires is that we will, you, you work with us, collaborate, we'll give you the information. We would ask that you keep that information internal for 12 months, and then whatever you choose to do with it, never tie our name to it. 
uh, don't you know we don't want to be linked to to advertising or promotion. Uh, so that may be a place in, in one example. Uh, for instance, we did a lot of work a few years ago evaluating various tools for proper euthanasia of young pigs in farrowing houses in nurseries. We did surveys of of how it affected the employees, and we shared all that information with the National Pork Board. That is in some of their curriculums today. So things that are broadly impactful for the for the good of the industry, uh, certain environmental things or projects that we do, um, the Pork Board becomes a, an outlet for communication. And it's up to them whether they want to use that or not. Of course, there's no obligation there. On the benefit of time, maybe just the last question. There are some more coming, but we'll just do one last uh, question. Um, obviously, your group, this is an investment for the company. Um, do you calculate your uh, return on investment on, on, on your project, on your group? What yes, we try to we we try to uh, at the end of every year, like uh, you know, when we have our budget meeting, we try to go in and say, you know, what were we successful in, and what was implemented. And I think you have to be careful about that um, because uh, you know everything is so interrelated. But we do sit down and make an accounting of where processes or change was implemented and what we can see as a value difference or outcome from that. So we, we do try to go back and keep score. Yep. Okay. Well, very good. With that, uh, Terry, please accept okay. this oh. uh, in honor of Bob. Thank you for giving the... Thank you very much. Appreciate it very much. Okay. Thanks for having me.